Welcome to the final session of the day, which is a lecture demonstration by Professor Bibhash Chaudhary from Gauhati University. And the theme will remain post-colonialism and Indian writing in English. So this is the final session for the day. Uh, it will go on for almost an hour. And may I now invite Dr. Bibhash Chaudhary, please. <coughs> okay, good afternoon. Uh, <coughs> The story that we have, uh, which is uh, already with you, uh, but we'll, uh, before going to the story and how to, uh, or how we can approach it or read it through the agency of post-colonialism, let's just uh, briefly run through the storyline. Now, uh, as you uh, <clears throat> have read, this story uh, is set in the late 1940s. That's what we have been told. Um, and from what we gather, we are also told the British had just left India, which means that the story could be anywhere between, say, 1948-49. And the setting is a small town um, in those days, small towns were, of course, not like the small towns we have today. So we have to imaginatively uh, recreate the ambience and the atmosphere referred to in the story. It's a small town. The, the town has a place called Rupohi. Rupohi is uh, the name given to a town. It's uh, like many other words in the story, which have been rendered into English, it's uh, a word, rupohi, uh, means someone who has beauty. So it's also a name that is given to a girl. So rupohi mean, could also mean a beautiful girl. In this case, uh, it stands for the town. Now, the town has... Um, some evidence of professions, different professions. We have uh, a doctor, we have uh, a police station, and we have lawyers. We also have teachers. So education, the legal system, the uh, law and order, and we also have a very important figure in the story, the magistrate. Uh, the storyteller, the narrator, tells us that <clears throat> like all flourishing small towns, flourishing in the sense of having a good uh, commercial uh, activity going on, it also had its own thief, a thief that belonged to the town. Now, this is, of course, as we are told or as we are <clears throat> informed, and this reflects some kind of affluence of its population because if there is nothing to steal, what would the thief be there for? So <clears throat> we get some idea of the economy or the economic circumstance in the town. And this economic circumstance has to do with how the thief functions. Now, this was a place where in the late 1940s, a small town that is slightly removed from the other <clears throat> larger towns immediately after independence in that there was no electricity. So the place did not have any electricity and uh, which was somewhat conducive for the thief to go about his business. So this thief, we are told, is one who has never been caught. So, uh, in fact, everyone recognizes him, in the, he recognizes him in the marketplace, in the shop, and they address him, but he has never been caught, or ne not that he has never been caught, but whenever he has been suspected of being the one doing the job, he has had some kind of alibi for which he is not held. So, another aspect of the story as we get to know is that they are known by their professions. So we are told that we have <clears throat> a 
a physician, a doctor, who is known as Himadri doctor. Uh, the word doctor in Assamese is pronounced as doctor. So uh, that is how the professions are attached to these individuals. We have a doctor, a lawyer, who is known as an ukil. That's the Assamese term for a lawyer. We have the uh, teacher or the teachers who are known as master. That's the term for a teacher. So this thief, who, who was the town thief, and uh, who was somewhat celebrated. And people addressed him just like they addressed anyone else. Um, and he was very nonchalant about how he went about things. So uh, because he was not detected, so he was just like any other member of the population or society. He was known as modern Sur. Sur is the term for thief. So we do not quite know, or it doesn't really matter to the people of the town how uh, they are to be addressed. Uh, normally, we address people by their surnames or full names. But in this case, the profession plays a part. Now, this has to do with the nature of the local, nature of the society. And uh, it's a somewhat laid back society. And it seems, from what we get uh, from the representation, that the wheels of the economy have never stopped, so things are going on fine. Um, modern source expertise uh, was, of course, exhibited in different ways. He uh, was a stealer of uh, things which were uh, sometimes uh, neglected or sometimes they were kept out of negligence by the household owners, by the people in the houses. And uh, from what we gather, he was uh, very good or adept in stealing at night. And uh, he stole everything from uh, clothes to uh, jewelry, from petty articles, things which would not be um, felt to have been lost. So he was very comfortable in doing that. And uh, because he, he had gained his experience, he was putting the experience to use, he was able to uh, diversify, uh, not only in this town. We are told that sometimes he went to the adjacent towns and there also he you know, had his pick. The uh, story reaches its climax when we have the uh, issue of the magistrate. Now, the town has a magistrate. Not quite, we are told, a collector or a commissioner. But then it was a small town, but it had its magistrate. And a magistrate, um, of course, was uh, a man of privilege. He was a man of power, of authority. And of course, he had his wealth. So the magistrate lived in a house, uh, which was a bungalow which was his official residence. He had two darwans, that is two sentinels or guards. And um, he had six daughters. And we are told the six daughters ranged from nine to 19. And uh, although uh, these six daughters, uh, two of them were married, but they occasionally came and stayed in their parental house when their husbands were away or husbands were out at, uh, in some professional work. This is the situation. This is the setting. And so modern Sur uh, decides um, that, or he makes a plan that he will carry out uh, some kind of an exercise where uh, he will decamp with whatever gold that the magistrate's daughters have. So for that, he does some homework, or he does some, uh, uh, let's say, stock taking by looking at the situation, by following the routines of the Darwans, uh, when they go to sleep, what their mannerisms are, uh, where do these daughters sleep, how many beds are there, um, what they do during the night when it's summer or when it's uh, very hot. And they have a panka walla who used to uh, wield the fans. But then after 7 o'clock, the panka walla disappears. So when they sleep, there are only the daughters sleeping. 
And because of the heat, they uh, take off their jewelry and put it beside them on a table. So this is something that he studies. On the day of the uh, actual action, when he happens to go about his business of <coughs> taking this um, jewelry, it was something that takes place um, not uh, quite by design, by, by the fact that he happens to see this as the right moment. He was returning, we are told, from a neighboring town with some uh, uh, loot which he had in, we are told, in his jhola, so the bag that he carried. And he came with a cycle, bicycle, and he had uh, already examined the route from which he would enter the house by the help of a branch of a mango tree. So he did not know initially what to do with the jhola because he can't keep it uh, by his bicycle. Anyone could take it, take it away. So he took his jhola, uh, put it beside the, uh, the plant inside the camp, campus, and then he went straight to the window, that window where that room which had these six daughters sleeping. Because he was quite an expert in carrying out this exercise, including stealing jewelry from those uh, who had never been able to catch him, so he thought that this was uh, not going to be that difficult. And we are told, because of experience, he had all his sharpness uh, going. So he was very alert, he was um, aware of the movements, and when he came beside the window, he saw that these six daughters, six girls or women were sleeping, and he could hear them sleeping. So there was, of course, nothing to be suspicious about from his point of view. And he saw that the uh, wealth, the gold, uh, different ornaments, uh, they had been taken off and they were there beside the table. So what was happening was, the situation was, there's there this uh, one girl or woman, it was dark, so she was in the bed beside the window, and so the gold ornaments were there across her. So he had to actually uh, go there, use his hand. And he also had some kind of an entrapment by which he could get them. Uh, but he decided to use his hand. So he goes, he stretches out his hand, he gets the wealth as much as he can take by the palm of his hand, he's retreating his hand, and then the story stops. And then we find the other point of view. The um, six daughters, they were there, it was very hot, and the eldest daughter, who was beside the window, uh, is from now from we get from the other side that she is someone who suddenly wakes up. But since it's all dark, the modern student doesn't know that he is being seen. And she is now in a position where everything runs on her mind that okay, here is this hand which is coming and who is going away with her jewelry. So what to do? It's 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 uh, uh, it's a decision she has to make, so she can't do anything. She uh, holds his hand and bites it. And um, modern Sur, who had not expected this, because he had done his homework, he had seen things were fine and things were in order, so he was about to ma make away with the loot, and then his hand is there, so he can't move. She shouts. Uh, and and uh, the other girls wake up, they make a lot of noise, people come in. Before anything could happen, he, he jerks the hand, hand off. It, there is, uh, it, it's all blood, it's dripping, um, and uh, he goes off. And now we start hearing, after he goes off, he, of course he disappears, he takes his bicycle, we don't get to know what happens to him. What we now get to know is a lot of versions that um, one of the sisters, uh, she says that this 
thief, very dark, as dark as one can be, uh, enters the room and he was about to murder my sister. And all these different uh, stories start emerging. The Darwan, who was in charge of uh, doing duty at night, he comes and um, all years go by and the story starts circulating about modern sur, about not modern sur as such, but about this thief. And um, everyone has a story to tell that this is what happened. A little earlier in the story, we are told that modern sur was uh, never caught. And this early in the story, not towards the end of the story. So there is a little time movement, as you have seen. We are told that modern Sur, 30 years later, was living a wonderful life of retirement. And he was doing pretty well. So what had happened? The next day, of course, uh, as um, would have been the situation in uh, the small town, he was the one to be suspected first. So they went to his house. This is how we are told towards the end of the story. And they went to his house, the authorities, and they found, uh, of course, they were looking for the hand that was bitten. So looking for that hand of the man, Modern Sur, of course, being the prime suspect. So they examined that what, what Modern Sur had done um, was something very clever. He had a fall, a real hard fall where he was really injured. And his face was somewhat defaced. So this entire part, uh, which also had his hand, everything was unrecognizable. So it's not only that which was injured, but the whole, uh, or you can say, a major part of his body was injured. So it's difficult to decipher whether this was the hand. So of course, they could not really track him. This is the uh, outline of the story. Now, if we are to look at this story and try to see it from the post-colonial perspective, uh, of course, certain things emerge and certain things to fit in. There are other things which don't fit in. Let us, let us try to see the patterns. What are the patterns? First of all, uh, you can see that there is a lot of stereotyping at work. Um, such as you'll find uh, there is a gender structure, there is a structure of society that is uh, almost copybook in the sense that this is how society is or this is how society is expected to respond. So in some ways, this stereotypical structuring of society facilitates the characterization. That we have a character like modern Sur, who, for whom the situation is perfectly amenable to his work, uh, seems almost like a fit case uh, for the kind of study we would uh, have when we look at a colonial situation or from a post-colonial perspective. You have uh, very, very recognizable hierarchies at work. You have the magistrate, uh, you have the stereotyping of women, women loving jewelry, uh, women um, having uh, very, very uh, well-positioned husbands, women coming back to their parents' house, um, non-working women. We, you, we also have uh, certain remnants of colonial life in the sense of that hierarchy being highly respected in society where certain professions are valued and a certain um, say decorum is followed for the operations of or let's say for social discourse now what 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 such an environment does is to invite us to see uh, whether certain uh, facets of post-colonialism can be applied, and if applied, how. For instance, you can see that there is uh, something that we looked at in the in, uh, morning lecture, 
uh, something that relates to the process of othering. Um, modern Sur is the other. He, he is, uh, in a way, a non-conformist other. Uh, he, he's not someone who lives in the shadows. So um, ideally, when you think of um, uh, a thief, uh, the thief would be someone who is not known or whose identity is not revealed. So you could say that, okay, here's a place where we have a thief. Um, but in, in this particular story, his identity is revealed. In fact, he is recognized as being engaged in thievery. That's the title of the story. So uh, he's someone whose profession is recognized and his expertise is also recognized. So this othering is also a kind of, uh, which involves a pr process where he is co-opted into that social frame that uh, uh, only because the society is affluent, the society is rich, the people are rich and can do away with certain things being stolen, that he has a place. So in a way, you can see that society is such, the society is such which facilitates a kind of hybrid citizenry. That we have a, a group of citizens who are, some are of course legitimately um, occupying positions of power, authority, and respectability, whereas a citizen like modern Sur and, uh, or others, we are not told that he was the only thief, but he was, let's say, the prominent thief, the recognized thief, the, let's say, the star thief of Rupohi. So in that sense, his was also uh, a factor in that uh, demographic index of society, where he was one of the registers through which others could say, okay, see, uh, uh, this place, Rupohi, has a thief as modern Sur. Uh, so the blurring of the individual in that social fabric is something that modern Sur facilitates, or, or we can say the characterization of modern Sur facilitates. The Characters, as is uh, the case with most stories, are not very, very well uh, worked out. So we, we, we only get uh, to go back to Forster, let's say, uh, somewhat flat characters. We, we get characters who are um, functionally active. We don't get to know many sides of these individuals. We are told that uh, what modern Sur does when he has certain, certain uh, traits are given to us. When modern Sur has a good haul of jewelry, he would keep them uh, uh, somewhere. Some he would sell. Uh, some he would keep them until the person disappeared from the scene or the person from whom he had stolen had left the place. And that was his plan. Because when the magistrate uh, uh, was there, he thought that he would use some of the jewelry and give it to his wife, Senehi. His wife is called Senehi. Senehi is an Assamese word, which we can translate as the loved one. And uh, so, so we find certain streaks of individuality. And since he is the primary character in modern Sur, in that, uh, he was, uh, we are told that he was, he was uh, not someone who uh, was disloyal to his wife, but of course when he went about his business at night, when he saw these beautiful ladies, depending on uh, the women and their bodies, he would like, uh, he had that voyeuristic tendency in him, uh, which he, uh, which, which, which was evident in the way he gloated over their bodies without them realizing. So there are certain aspects of individuality which are inscribed into the character. Uh, we can read them post-colonially. Now I, I would like to um, hear your experience of reading a story of how, how are we to, or how we can look at 
uh, a character like Modern Sur or the whole environment, social environment, through some of the post-colonial tropes that you are familiar with? Or would you say that uh, there are certain things in the story that do not lend to a post-colonial reading? We could, for instance, also uh, do a Marxist reading of the story. Uh, it's, it's not necessary that a text will subscribe to one particular theoretical model. Um, so, so we could look at the whole situation from uh, maybe a convergence of different theoretical models. So um, the point I was making in, in the, in the uh, earlier lecture was about the subaltern and the minor. So uh, if, if you look at it from a distance, from a very far distance, uh, take a drone view, for instance, then modern Suru may appear to be a subaltern, an underprivileged, or someone who has not had the opportunities others have had in society, so he has had to take recourse to such, uh, um, such uh, action that he indulged, indulged in. Um, but would it be uh, a case of him being a subaltern? In fact, uh, could we say that he's uh, occupying that marginal space because it suits him? So it's not a matter of compulsion, rather a matter of choice to occupy that position of marginality from which he can uh, mount his attacks on the center. Or in a way, the center also wants his presence because it shows how accommodating the center is by giving him that space. So I'd like to uh, hear your views. I hope you have read the story. Okay. Okay, uh, a very good point. But uh, I, I, could we say that um, if there was no experience of colonialism, and if we have a situation like this where there is modern Suriname in any small town, uh, how do you read that? Um, because uh, he he thrives on being a thief. It's something that actually takes delight in. So uh, if you read it from the magistrate's point of view, uh, or if you read it from the other side, then we, we could say that, oh yes, he is underprivileged, and he is not as privileged as the magistrate. But um, you, you could make an argument uh, from this side uh, by saying that you, you don't have the professional wherewithal. You don't have the uh, requirement to come and sit on this side. So it's not that you are there because you have been pushed there, but because you don't meet the requirements. And so you are making the best of what you have from that position. So um, that element is, I think, also embedded in the story in that he, he, he thrives on that capital. In fact, he has honed, honed is a w one word which is used in the story. He has honed his skills expertly so that he can take advantage of uh, the gullibility let's say, of the people. So uh, do you think that the stereotyping is something that um, affects the um, whole story? Uh, do you think that the story is a little more elaborate than it could have been?
let, let us um, look at another situation. Say, someone like, uh, you have read Midnight Children? Okay, someone like, say, Salim Sinai, uh, we can look at him as a uh, uh, subject. We can look at him post-colonially, we can look at him as a colonial subject, and we can examine the ways in which he is situated and placed. Uh, do you think someone like Modern Sur, in the way he is characterized, in the way he is configured, um, uh, could naturally incline us towards such a theoretical approach or incline us towards uh, such a reading? Do you think that when you read this story, the first thing that comes to your mind, oh, this is something we can read post-colonially? Is that the first thing that would come to your mind? Or do you say, no, it's open to any kind of interpretation? What other uh, possibility do you see when you look at this story apart from, say, post-colonialism? Do, do you think in, in, the, in the previous lecture <coughs> you had this uh, whole uh, post-structuralist examination uh, do you think this is possible here? Yes. Uh, you see sets of binaries? What's the absence of that? Like we don't know much about, even though there are these six daughters, we are not told much about them, only the name of the first daughter. But uh, is absence uh, uh, then uh, solitary do uh, in the solitary domain of post structuralism? Yeah, yeah I, f I feel that, that of course uh, you can actually uh, look at how, um, that's, that, that's the point I was making about the stereotyping process, that the stereotyping of women, and of course the, um, if, if you look at, except for uh, the uh, female teacher, all the other professions that are named are named for men. And the, the professional world in the late uh, 1940s um, was such, uh, that is, in the story that we have, uh, was not open to everyone. So, so in, in that sense, it was a very closed society. And in a way, post-colonialism uh, looks at such closed situations where, where, where opportunities are limited, where, where, where the othering is very, very consolidated and firm. Uh, in, in the case of modern Sur, he, he, you know, um, I, I found um, uh, this uh, both to be somewhat typical, uh, you, know, you discussed typicality in the previous lecture, and somewhat atypical uh, in the sense that he is not the typical thief. Um, uh, thieves in stories or thieves in fiction, um, uh, when, we, when we have them as marginal figures, are not uh, presented as such, not presented in this manner. Um, and he had some, some of the things going for him as a thief. He was, uh, his skin was dark. Uh, so, of course, uh, as you said, uh, in this interplay, this binary between dark and light, or uh, it not being a, a full moon night. It is a full night story, but not, there is no moon. So he was able to make use of that darkness, and he, he, we are told that he was accustomed to his darkness. And we are told that because he could see everything, not because it was physically uh, seen, but because of his experience and because he had done the mapping of the place during the daytime. So, so in a way, uh, the, the uh, foregrounding of his skills as a thief uh, becomes very prominent. It becomes very um, essential to the looking of uh, the uh, space. How, how do we look at this whole space uh, that the story presents to us? Um, Or is 
problem and I split it. The dark aura holds more, more prevalent over the light aura. Yeah, yeah. Now, you see, post-structuralism and post-colonialism are not uh, rivals who don't talk to each other. Okay? Uh, they are very much in conversation. Sometimes they sit together and you can't quite make out who is who. Um, Homi Bhabha does that. He, he uses a lot of deconstruction um, to do post-colonial theory. And um, the thing about binaries, uh, I found it interesting, and uh, the previous lecture was excellent in that it, it, it mapped the uh, manner in which uh, binarism works and how, how that can be seen to be fudged when you look at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, this dark light situation, um, or let's say privileged, underprivileged uh, binary, if you to call, um, if, if, if we are to go back to Derrida, and if you are to look at uh, what he said in Of Grammatology, uh, he said that he does not disagree with Ferdinand de Saussure regarding uh, the signifier and the signified, or what is the realm of signification. What he has to add to is, this is what he says in Of Grammatology, is that it is not closed. It's not a closed system, signifier and signified in Derrida's view is not a closed system. So in that sense, if we are to draw that and bring this into post-colonial discourse and look at the situation that we have here in this particular text and look at the binary of the light and dark, modern sur and the other, or society and modern sur, or the uh, others in this story, then you see that these binaries are somewhat fudgy in the, se in the sense that Badansur is someone who we can argue occupies a position of privilege in that sen in the sense that he's not answerable to anyone. Uh, you know, Mikhail Bakhtin um, talked about answerability, and this is one of the conditions of uh, the ethical position um, that we can look at ethics as being governed by the condition of answerability. What is ethics? That you are answerable, maybe to yourself, maybe to uh, some kind of matrix that you refer to, maybe your society, maybe anything. You, 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 you said that other. Uh, modern Sur does not seem to have that. So he, he, he in a way, is somehow, and, and that is how this story is uh, designed, that he seems to be somehow, somehow out of this ethical bind of answerability, that he is answerable only to himself. So he has only his own skill, his expertise, and his success uh, in front of him. So, so long, we are told he has never been caught. So, so, so in a way, he is his own master, whereas the others are not. The magistrate we know, or we are told, is transferable. The magistrate's daughter tells uh, him, not the uh, daughter who beat modern Sue's hand, but another daughter tells him that, oh, this is our loot, because the jhola was there. It was not carried by modern Sue. So when they found it, she says that this is ours. Can't we keep it? The magistrate doesn't. Magistrate is upright, he says, no, we'll take it and we'll give it back to the owner. So we can see this as answerability. He could have kept it. He, it's, it's something that uh, is not unheard of, but then he decides to subscribe to what is expected of him as a magistrate to be lawful. So he, he takes that jola, and that is what he says, he'll take the jola and restore it. So that is answerability, answerability to his position, answerability to his society. So in a way, in that sense, um, if we look at the uh, society as occupying a position of privilege or the magistrate family and the magistrate being somewhat elitist, we see modern Sur as being the marginalized. So this is another kind of marginalization where he is not answerable to the norms of society. 
he is not answerable to the expectations of society. He is not expected to conform to the rules and regulations of society. And without that being quite stated, the rule being stated, uh, the magistrate goes on and hands over. He goes on and hands over, that's what he says, that he'll hand over the stolen jewels, which of course does not belong to him. So in a way, he is answerable to that unseen, unstated law, rule, which says uh, you keep what is yours and not something that isn't. But for modern sur, that doesn't apply. So, so in, in that sense, he is on the margins or outside the limits of civilized living. The wounding, the, the, the wounding, yeah. the injury that he, he yeah. inflicts, inflicts upon himself. Yeah. But you, you, you could say that is an extreme survival tactic, otherwise he'll be caught. So he does come to the social matrix at a certain point of view. Yeah. But it's not that he No, I, I think I think what we can, you're right in a way, what, what he does is that he realizes that he must conform to the grammar of social governance. So in order, he, um, he has to, uh, he knows the grammar, he doesn't subscribe to it. Now is a situation he has to conform. So since he has to conform, he must create this situation where he is not suspected. And when he is not picked up or when he is not examined, his bodily not examined. And when he is bodily examined, then he is not seen to be the one because he is so injured that, of course, he couldn't have been someone who's only a part of his hand was bitten. Now, it is not answerability by choice. It's answerability by compulsion. He has no, no, no uh, choice before him. No option A and option B and C before him that no, I am going to remain who I am or I am going to go away. Okay? In a way, he is enhancing his marginality by saying, I am going to remain here by being modern Sur, by being the modern Sur who did not attempt the uh, burglary. And only way to remain who I am, being modern Sur, uh, is to be seen as someone who did not attempt it. So in a way, he chooses to stay outside the fence by conforming to grammar on this side of the fence for the time being, because that is the tactic that he feels is the only way, is, is, is like a time loop, is like a window through which he comes, he meets the requirements of society, society examines, and he goes back, and he goes back to being who he was. He, of course, uh, from what we gather, he has, uh, he has a long life. Uh, he does not, does not uh, attempt anything so risky or hazardous. He does not do that. But then uh, he goes back to being he, who he was. So, so one, one of the things that we find in post colonial studies is, is how the subaltern is trying to uh, move up the scale, how, how there is always this, uh, uh, for a society to move forward, it must accommodate uh, the complex variables, including the variety of its people. And uh, the subaltern would, of course, like to occupy a position that is uh, different from uh, the subaltern space. Um, Modern Sur finds that, and that is, that is the, I find Modern Sur to be a very, very hybridized character in that he finds that space which is marginal, which is technically subaltern, he is uh, 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 not a professional in the social sense, 
he finds that position of marginality to be a position of privilege. It is something that gives him freedom. It is something that gives him the light, the power, the authority to determine for himself his professional path and his lifestyle. It's a life of risk. It's a life where he has to uh, indulge in something. He, he believes that there'll come a time when, when he'll no longer have to work at night. We, we hear the phrase night shift being referred to. He's a night shift worker. And uh, we also see uh, lapses, lapses in, in, in the system, in the governance system, in the, in the um, security system, uh, by means of which he is able to work out. Uh, do you think that the story um, is, and that's the point I, I wanted to know from you, do you think that it is a story where time has come to a stop in the sense that we are told that modern Sur has been about this for a long time, sufficiently long time for him to gain experience. He has uh, mastered the skill. Why has that society not developed a mechanism where someone like modern Sur or what he has been doing can be prevented? Is it a reflection of the character of that society but the society feels that, oh, these are petty things. We are not worried about that. But we are told in the story there comes a time when jewels start to disappear. And, and in a way, the society doesn't feel so aggrieved or uh, so affected that we don't see an alternative security mechanism being brought about. Uh, which would serve as a deterrence to someone like modern Sur. Do you see this as um, something that has a bearing on the story? Uh, do you think that the time is, in a way, moving in a circular fashion? Although we are g given great time zones, we are told 30 years, 20 years, uh, we are told one of our sisters went on to become a fiction writer, so she embellishes that day's experience, that night's experience, and there's a lot of ingredients, imaginative ingredients, put into that uh, narrative which is told and which is circulated for years later. So something that uh, Edward Said brought into postcolonial discourse, uh, postcolonial studies, is the way the Orient was made into a subject of discourse when it started uh, working, where, where, where people started believing in the credibility of the narrative. So this narrative by the, uh, one of the younger daughters of the magistrate gained credibility because he was an, she was an expert storyteller. So do you think that although we have this great time zone movement, we have, we're looking into the future and we are coming back, um, but somehow the society seems to be caught in some kind of a time warp. Do you, do you see that happening? Yeah, yeah. So th th that's, that's the point I was actually looking for at the beginning. You see that, that, that the society is in a way crystallized in some kind of a concrete matrix, okay? It, changes don't take place. There's hardly any change happening. We're not getting to know of any social change that takes place in the families, in the professions, in the people's behavior, or in their response to... Uh, a modern sur and uh, why why is this important because a thief coming and taking off um, your um, items or wealth or whatever uh, anything from clothes to jewelry to any anything that is lying around uh, that cannot be an acceptable situation for long it can happen of course but then there will be 
the society will respond by uh, working out deterrence that, okay, we'll put this system in place. The society does not seem to uh, really uh, work on that. Uh, or let's say the people do not work on that. So what we have here is a thriving uh, modern sur. So do you think that the society is somewhat responsible for his rise or for his growth? Yeah, right, right. But um, yeah, I agree, fully agree. So you see, you see this uh, uh, whole process of narrative making, uh, the way the narrative, so there are two layers actually, the narrative that is made by the townspeople or the people who are part of the society and the narrative made by the stories narrator. Okay, so there are two narratives at work which, which, which contribute to this collation of this coming together, of convergence, of this idea of uh, the marginal character being accommodated into society because it's, it's, it's a form of, it's, or let's say it's a signature of the, the prosperity of the town. Um, so so what, what is interesting here is that this is again something that Edward Said talks about in, in, in his chapter in you have read uh, Orientalism. He talks about it in Orientalism in crisis. He says, he says, he talks about how certain discourses take over, how certain discourses take over and circumvent circumvent the the very object that is that is seeks to negate. So in in a way, the um, accommodation of the marginal as the marginal, the thief as the thief, and allowing the thief to prosper just because it's, it signals the prosperity of the town is in a way allowing the discourse to take over. It doesn't quite really matter to the people whether it's modern sur, but then it's, it's that, okay, see, we have so much to spare. And, and it, it, it is in a way a legitim legitimization of the hierarchical structure of society which is not going to be dismantled. So it, it doesn't quite allow Allowing modern sur to remain modern sur and not provide any scope for his correction. In fact, the people recognize him as modern sur and ask him, okay, what have you done today? What have you got today? Or where are you at that place? He has an alibi. So by allowing him that space, he is being allowed that space only in his capacity as a marginal figure. So his marginality remains marginal. So in a way, the, the, the society seems to be caught in a time warp, and which, which, is, which is one of the things that we find in many colonial societies represented in narratives, in, 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 narratives, in, in narratives that talk about such world experiences. In fact, uh, you know um, how Chinua Achebe took on Conrad because he was looking at a society that was so closed and so um, structured to be almost uh, very, very clearly defined in terms of that racial operative uh, dimension, which Chinua Achebe saw in Heart of Darkness to be um, completely out of place. 
So, so in that sense, this kind of an orientation, this kind of a structuring, this kind of a modeling of a character like Modern Sur, who, who is both. He is outside the fence and inside the fence. He is part of us and he is none of us. And, and, and this, this duality, um, uh, which um, again to use a term by Bhava, puts him in what can be called an in-between space. He is uh, both part of society and he is an outcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 it's 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 not not something that enables us to look at him in terms of black and white. He's he's not he's not he's black in terms of his designation. People say, oh, we have modern sur. Maybe you're visiting some relative, and you say, oh, you you don't have. We have you see, we have modern sur. And and you see, this contributes to something that postcolonialism examines. That is what we call myth making or the study of folklore. He becomes, even as he lives, even as he's there, he becomes the subject of the people's imagination. Folklore, he becomes the subject of the imagination of the people. He is some, someone who is created to be larger than life, even as he's in front of them. And this, this is something, this, this, this discourse making, this, this whole, this, this is an, as you said, it is an active process of participatory dialectic where the modern sur and society, they meet in, they converge and create this interface where one cannot do without the other in this narrative of, of, of prosperity and, of course, uh, cohabitation. I would say that he is co-opted into society because he's made to cohabit that space, uh, not made into uh, member of the society, but as someone who participates in the social discourse. And I, I think one, one of the objectives of postcolonialism is to examine such uh, blurry spaces where one could look at people not in terms of the, uh, as we saw from the last lecture, from the, in terms of binaries or in terms of occupied positions, in terms of well-defined situations, but by looking at such possibilities where they open up our understanding of social discourse. How social discourses are very, very complex mechanisms that roll out such structures where the, if we come to the story, where does the power center lie? If we, since in the last lecture you're talking about the center, where does the center lie? So we could say to quote Derrida, here, the center is not the center. So if, if modern Sur is the center, then he is, in a way, shifting or playing, is the playful center that oper operates in a discursive structure rather than the magistrate should have been the center of society. The magistrate isn't. Modern Sur is the center of the narrative. But by being the center of the narrative, he shifts the center from a well-regulated social mechanism to a departure. Modern Sur is a departure. He's, 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 he's let's say, a sliding signifier. Okay, he, he slides and he takes the center with him. So in a way, he is drawing the center towards him. Okay, and creating that hybrid space where the discourse is controlled by what he does and how he's configured in the people's imagination. Uh, there's a book by, uh, I think, uh, what's his name, Philip Mitchell, called Imperial Nostalgia, uh, which is published in 2021 by Manchester University Press. Uh, Mitchell, Imperial Nostalgia, where he, where he gives an example of uh, how in the 19th century uh, and late 18th century, certain things were constructed. Uh, he gives examples of the India office um, constructing certain discourses through certain artifacts as having come from India or having come from exotic lands. 
and to create that sense of aura of difference being a sign of civilization that all these things which are out of this world are now available here or a part of this world so in a way modern sur who is out of the society is part of us okay so he 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 he, he in a way creates this old world pre civilized charm for the people to refer to see we have modern sur okay he's, he's a part of an old world a kind of folkloristic space where which is somewhat unreal and he is out there he is in the midst of us as a point of reference so in in that sense this the, he is also a um, let's say a figure who points back towards a society where law and order was not in place where people lived through a very different social structuring mechanism and now here we have all the professions we have a lawyer we have a police officer we have a magistrate and we have this remnant of that old world whose this new world has accommodated okay franz fanon in rage of the earth talks about this how there is this whole process of accommodation but it is also a process of othering accommodation with othering so it's accommodated but simultaneously othered by the same society i think uh, it's time so if you have any questions otherwise i'll say thank you So when Sur became like this folkloric figure, this mythical figure, do you think he stopped uh, uh, stealing or robbery as soon as he was in the midst of about to be caught by someone? Like as soon as he was breaking from the whole myth, because he is never caught. No one actually knows if Sur was there or if he was not. But as soon as he was about to be caught, uh, and uh, and also given by the difference of the Raja Ravi Varma, the whole voyeuristic aspect of it, yeah, yeah. the figure comes out of the painting and catches him. Do you think like that aspect also like shakes his center a little bit in the story? Yeah, I, I think I think the mystique would be gone. Yeah. Yeah. So so we don't know after this incident. Surely he must have carried out. Not here. We are told he didn't attempt again in the master's house. We are told, but we are told that thirty years later he was reading, leading a prosperous life. Of course, his prosperity couldn't have been by some magic. He must have been at it. but you're right that that he is also conscious of his contribution to the myth that he is uh, someone who is uncapturable and um, uh, again to go back to walter benjamin he he, he creates his aura okay so long as that he is not imaged okay if you have everyone wearing a che guevara shirt then it's gone it's not like the mona lisa this is what uh, walter benjamin talks about so so if if he he gets caught and he comes out and he gets caught and he comes out the aura is gone so someone who is never caught so in in that sense yes and, and this is something that he you can say you're right he controls the center and he holds it maybe he holds it for some time maybe he gives it um some time and space and then when he thinks that okay things are okay and i can i can go ahead yeah he contributes to the lore as much as the people contribute to his making Yeah, yeah. So that gaze is there, and also his power is constantly shifted. So he is in the position of power at night, but the magistrate, at some other point, is in the position of power, and the women are like her sisters are weaving this story about him. So that time they have the power. Yeah, yeah, they have the narrative power, yeah. and he has the power of thievery. Okay, and if you've seen the book, it's it's that it's it's dark. Then the the face of Kali is there. 
So it, it has some reference to this story and of course the other stories. No, I, I, you could say Madan Shur, his character itself or characterization makes use of that slippage. Okay, so, so as to not concretize him in such a way where he holds in, in, in the eyes of the uh, people, but he holds in terms of his dexterity and his ability to understand the uh, power of the narrative so that he, he sometimes holds himself back and sometimes he lets go. So, and that is how the center keeps shifting. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you once again, Professor Chaudhuri, for that fascinating talk. And for a formal vote of thanks, may I now invite Dr. Meenakshi Shehri, who is the Research Assistant for Indian Writing in English Online. Thanks, Atul. Uh, this is, of course, not the end of the symposium. We have another day uh, of events tomorrow. But uh, uh, please allow me to thank uh, Professor Bibhash Chaudhary from Gauhati University and Dr. Neeraja Sundaram from Azim Premji, who have, uh, through their close readings of A Full Night's Thievery and uh, A Horse and Two Goats, uh, taught us several ways to read uh, Indian writing in English or other texts of Indian writing in English via these uh, theoretical frames. Um, tomorrow, of course, we have a day with sessions on refugee studies uh, by Professor Dilip Kumar Das and uh, eco-criticism by Professor Swarnalata Rangarajan. Um, I will quickly thank a few others. Uh, uh, professors Anna Kurin and Professor Pramod Nair, of course, who, without whom the symposium would not have happened. Uh, Atul Nair, uh, our project assistant and PhD scholar who has been working tirelessly for the symposium. Our volunteers, Noah and Saurabh, who I am at a loss. Um, I do not know which committee I should assign you to because you're everywhere. Uh, Shahim Khushbu and Roy, who have helped out uh, uh, in several th with several things today. Uh, Miss Sharon, who's not here, but who designed the posters for us. The technicians who helped us with the hall arrangements, the technicians who are here uh, for the video recording, office staff from the Department of English, who also have helped us out. Um, all right, I think uh, the rest of the list will come tomorrow. Thank you so much.